As you're working through this first project, and, and in having read the, the Project One descriptions linked to the top of the Module One page and watched the, uh, the video overview, I know that you probably have some questions about how you're going to explain a joke in, in a thousand or fifteen hundred words. And that's a good question. I think as soon as you walk through this presentation, you realize that the majority of the time is spent analyzing and explaining the obvious because it seems obvious, is going to be something that's going to make your lives a little bit easier. So what I want to do is spend some time here explaining the rhetorical situation uh, of humor, that is, applying the, the rhetorical triangle for ethos, pathos, and logos to discuss how we can talk about humor before we talk about taking an inventory of a text and asking questions about, you know, what it is and its parts, you know, dissecting the frog, uh, asking the question, how, how do the, the parts connect? And then finally evaluating it. How did that frog live? Or why was that joke supposed to be funny? And then finally ending with an example of that, those steps. So the very first thing we have to do is call back to uh, Tara's video on, on the rhetorical triangle. And these are pretty simple concepts we think about all the time. Ethos, pathos, and logos. We just don't call them that generally. If you were if you got dressed this morning and you went out, or you got dressed to get coffee, or went to the kitchen or something, it doesn't really matter. Um, you've employed all three of these concepts already. Logos, what are the elements I'm going to use to, to dress myself? For example, pants, t-shirt, uh, hat, uh, shoes, socks, sandals. Why? For what audience? For myself, for my own sense of being, for someone else who's going to see me? Maybe I want someone to think of me in a certain way. Uh, ethos, who I am, and that I, the thing that I want to reflect in my choices. These are all things we consider because we're rhetorical beings. We're always thinking about these things. When it comes to a text, though, whether it's an outfit or a piece of comedy, we ask these questions about the who. Uh, who is the speaker? What, what's that person's credibility? So when you read Wimsett and Beardsley, what's their credibility as PhDs in literature and um, philosophy? Does that make them more believable when they talk about philosophy and literature? How? Who is the audience? Who is this text aimed at, right? So, for example, Wimsett and Beardsley's 1946 article from the Sewanee Review, who do you think the target audience is? Is it students in a freshman writing class in 2016 Florida? Or do you think it was probably for someone in 1946 who was having a conversation about how to think about intention in terms of judging or valuing poetry? So we talk about audience, and it's really important because we get things like logos. Think about the words you encountered or the organization you encountered, or the examples you encountered in Wimsett and Beardsley's The Intentional Fallacy. Are those appropriate to you as an audience? If there's an incongruity there, well, we have to ask a question. We can start arguing about that. These are the kinds of questions you can consider for any text. Again, you can think about an outfit you're wearing, clothes you're wearing, um, the way you uh, drive your car, uh, Wimsett and Beardsley's text, or a joke, an SNL skit, for example. And the fourth element here we want to add, and I also want to point your attention back to the UNF Guide for Writing sixth chapter that starts with a section on Kairos, timing. Timing is crucial to comedy. Things that were funny in the 1930s probably aren't funny now because the contexts have changed. Things that were funny in 2008 politics probably make no sense right now to people who are voting for the first time in 2016. In the same way, humor from Dana Carvey, say, in 1992 with George uh, Herwalker Bush is, is different from someone doing humor right now for, say, Bernie Sanders or for Donald Trump. Timing is everything with comedy, and so it's something we have to address. So what is the kairos, the timing? How did that thing become exigent? What are the circumstances here? In asking these kinds of questions, we're getting at this idea of, of what. That is, not a question, but a statement. That you're inventorying, you're asking questions. You know, who's in the text? What, what are the person's credentials? How, uh, what does the text do? What are its parts? So think about your rhetorical reading notes worksheets. That's the majority of those questions. Asking what questions? Trying to get at that just the facts thing, things we can all agree on. So we all read Wimsett and Beardsley. We all read the same text. But what are the things we agree upon? The author's names, for example, the, the publication information, for example, the words that are on the page, for example. So we'll all agree that the word the appears 95 times, for example, if it did. We could count them, right? These are just the facts. These are generally agreed, agreed upon statements akin to, I call them the sky is blue statements. There's no real dispute in them. There's no argument. That's summary. That's why when you write a summary, there's not a lot of argumentation that goes into it, if any, or analysis. Instead, that's the second step that, that proceeds from your inventory. Once you've inventoried a text, you can analyze those materials. So imagine you've asked these questions, 
and you've written down your responses, you can go through those questions now and analyze uh, your responses to find patterns or connections. You know, how many times does the word fallacy appear in the text? Is that crucial? Is that important? Or what kinds of examples uh, do Whimsy and Beardsley call on? Are they mostly... Um, uh, from an antique period? Are they mostly contemporary examples? So you can start drawing observations about how the text works in that way. You can also identify incongruities, which you know I'll note here for you because that's important with, with uh, comedy. When things don't match up, think about absurdity, hyperbole. Things are generally humorous and we don't know why or can't put our fingers on it. Uh, anything that sticks out to you though, that's what you're looking to analyze. How does that thing function? And in the end, we get to this third step of evaluation. Is it funny? Does it work well? How well does it work? To give value to. Think about what the root word of evaluation is. To evaluate it is to assign value to it. So does that text succeed in being humorous? Does the text succeed in being humorous for you? Different contexts, different kinds of answers. Depends on audience, always, for humor. So I want to go through an example here. And I'm going to pull this up on the screen. You can watch it here or you can fast forward and watch it on your own. But a couple years ago, maybe five years ago now, um, Honda in the Pacific put out a bunch of ads um, for how much blank can you pack in a jazz. And we get things like how much hipster, how much ninja, how much muscle, how much um, hip hop. And you get the idea. They're, they're asking a question. But the way they, they illustrate their their um, their answer is, is kind of fun. And so we We'll go through this commercial here, I've, I've muted it, but what I want you to pay attention to are the elements. And I'm asking what questions as I go through it, and I'm writing down these notes. And so we start with, what do we see on the screen? We see a, a small a hatchback vehicle, a Honda Jazz. We start seeing people walking in. He has a panda hat on his head, a scientist blowing a foghorn of some kind, um, fixed gear bicycles being put in the trunk, Apple iPod devices. Um, Vinyl records being put in a CD player, ironically, root beer of some kind, uh, Jonathan and Saffron, well, uh, crocheting, uh, Polaroid camera. What else do we have? All these things. People are just being jam-packed in this car. And so we get this idea of we can take apart the text elements here. We can look at it and see how does it work. And when we do, we start getting a bunch of information, a bunch of data that we, we record. And on its face and on its own, each of these pieces of data means nothing. Someone wearing a panda hat. Great, what does that mean? It mean? Well, no thing means anything by itself. It has to be in conversation. That's why we get to the analysis step. But before we do, we have to be methodical. You might think about a biology lab. You're just trying to draw down notes about what you've seen. Who's talking? What do we see in the ad? What do these people look like? How are they dressed? What are they doing? What is their behavior? What are they wearing? What kind of music is playing in the background? What's the tempo like? Does it change? Is it consistent? Uh, where does the commercial air? Can we look on the YouTube channel and find out? When was it published? What was the period? What was the time? What are the parts of the ad? Come back to the music here. I'll tell you right now, if you watch the commercial, it splits in half, so it has two parts. One with a fast-paced, frenetic, you know, they're jamming things into a car, and the second, slower, methodical, um, people talking about the car. So you can see it broken into parts. So this is where we get to the idea of a thesis in terms of our sense of humor. How does the ad work? How do they do things? How do they answer the question? If the question is, how much hipster can you pack in a jazz, do they ever answer it? Is there actually a metric? For how much you could pack in there? Um, well, they don't ever answer it, do they? But they illustrate it by jamming a bunch of things in that car and using a bunch of hyperbole, so they kind of answer it. The question you have to address, though, is how do they do that? With which, which tools do they call on to accomplish that end? So when you're arguing your paper here, you're trying to explain what makes it funny by explaining the parts of it, identifying the parts of it, inventorying, and making connections among those pieces. If you're having trouble finding pieces of text to analyze, they're everywhere. Especially in a 2016 political season as we're in right now, you're going to start seeing a bunch of Bernie Sanders skits, um, Sarah Palin skits, uh, Hillary Clinton skits. You can look at historical things from Jon Stewart and The Daily Show or Monty Python. Any late night program over the last 50 years, you know, uh, David Letterman, Johnny Carson, it won't matter. You'll find political things. If you don't like political things, you can uh, go to other things. For example, Key and Peele on Comedy Central, Broad City. Anything like anything you think is funny, it's probably funny, is something you can take apart. I just recommend it be brief. You only have three to five pages of space here. And only a paragraph of this paper should be your discussing what the text was that is summarizing it. The other three pages of it is analysis. 
So if you're planning on writing three pages of here's what happened, here's what happened, here's what happened, you stop now, don't think that. Instead, go forward thinking, I get one paragraph to explain what the text is in a summary paragraph. Everything else, though, is analysis. That means I'm explaining, I'm arguing, I'm illustrating, and it's my thoughts. It's not me just putting the text into my own words or doing story retelling. That won't fly beyond summary. That's analysis that you want to accomplish here. You want to get to the point of being able to analyze the text. So think about the summaries you've been writing are all what's, right? Who wrote it? What's it about? What happens in it? What are the parts of it? Period. Now we're getting to the analysis and the synthesis part where you get to actually start combining information, seeing connections, explaining connections. At the bottom here, I've included Emma Walsh's, uh, or rather a link to Emma Walsh's Rhetoric of Humor. Um, she's uh, got a Prezi here that on one of the slides identifies 13 comic devices, and it may be useful for you to have a language to discuss the comic features of a text. So I've included that here for you.